let's, uh, let's ask for the Lord's blessing on our time together. Father, we thank you uh, for this opportunity to come and to just give you th th just gratitude and wonder and thanks and praise uh, for the fact that, through, that we are able to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, as we look at the questions from the catechism this morning, uh, we just pray that, that we would uh, look at these and we would, we would wonder that we have been given the gift of faith, that we have the benefits of all of Christ's work for us, and that we are freed uh, from bondage to sin and to, uh, to, to obey you, not out of fear and uh, of punishment, but out of love and gratitude. And so, Lord, we just pray that these truths would be made precious to us this morning, that we would be prepared to, um, to worship you as we go forward, and that all of this would be done to the glory of the name of our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, if any of you are new or don't know me, my name is Michael Kelly. I'm one of the elders here at King's Cross Church, and we are continuing our series through the, uh, the Orthodox Catechism, uh, which is, of course, a Baptist version of the uh, Heidelberg Catechism. Last week, uh, Pastor Travis looked at the question about how are you righteous before God? which is, of course, probably about the most important question that any of us could ever ask ourselves and that we need to have an answer to. And, of course, the, the answer that the Catechism provides, that Scripture provides, is that, that how are we righteous before God? Only by faith in Jesus Christ. And so now that, of course, the, the follow-up question is, is why? Why is it that the case? Why do you affirm that you are made righteous by faith only? And so we, we, we talked a bit last time about how uh, that our culture has some pretty wonky ideas about what faith is. Uh, we talk about faith as if it's some sort of good in and of itself. You just, you've got to have faith. I learned that from George Michael when I was a teenager. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> for those of you who that, does, that, that is not a relevant reference to. Uh, but what if we said, when people say, you just got to have faith, what do, they, what do they mean by that? Or is it so nebulous that we don't even know? It's like a, when, when you wish upon a star. Yeah, it's sort of like, you just got to just kind of believe that things are going to get better. Right? I think mean, that's kind of what they mean. Like, you just, you just got to have faith when you just, you just mean that, like, you know, right now it's hard and you're going through some, through some hard things. And the only thing we can tell you is, yeah, that's hard. Boy, I hope it sure gets better. And that's really all you're left with. And, and like, you, you see, you got to have faith. And why do you got to have faith? Because, well, things would be pretty sad if they never did get better. And that's, and that's your, if, that, if your only hope is things getting better, you just got to kind of act like they will because the, what's the option? The option is, despair. That's not what the scripture is talking about by faith. When we talk about by faith, uh, in order, you know, faith sort of presupposes that you have faith in something. That's why it's, it's so silly to say you just got to have faith. Faith in what? The implicit thing is there. Faith that things won't always be as bad as they are right now, I guess. But when we talk about having faith, what do we mean by that? There are, when we talk about faith, uh, classically, uh, theologians have talked about faith as having three different components, um, which is first, knowledge. You know, for you have faith in something, you have to know about it. But like, for instance, if I know Greek myths about, you know, uh, Achilles and how he was dipped in the river Styx and that he was invulnerable in every place but his heel where he was dipped in the river, uh, I, I know that story. Does that mean that I have faith in that story? No, because, because I, I know it, but I don't. But the second part to faith is assent, which is that not only do I know this, the, 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 this set of facts, but I also uh, believe these facts to be true. And so you need to know, know facts. You need to believe that that's true. Is that enough for faith? Is that does that constitute faith? No, I mean, because what does the Bible tell us about the demons? It says they, they believe, 
Yes, as you believe in James, it says, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe that, and shudder. So there is, you can believe something, you can know something, you can believe it's true, that does not mean that you have faith in it. The last component that makes something faith is trust. We believe that it is, that these facts, we believe that they are true, and I trust that they are true even for me. I might look at a rope bridge and say, yes, that is a bridge. I am informed that it is intended for people to walk across this canyon from one side to the other. Is that faith? That's, that's, no. I, I might further say, I know that it looks well made. It looks, it looks reasonably maintained. It was constructed by knowledgeable people and experienced people. Uh, I can see that other people are up here to be crossing this bridge. But I'm not getting on it. Do I have faith in that bridge? No. Only when I say, this bridge is safe for me to cross, and I am willing to put my weight on it, I'm going to trust it with my safety, do I, do I have faith that that bridge is safe? And so it is not just generic faith that saves, it is knowledge, assent, and trust in, G in Jesus Christ and that he and he alone saves. And the important thing is that we see that faith uh, is not a work in and of itself. I remember one of the, the first things that's got my brain sort of ticking as a teenager about understanding, asking questions that eventually led me to embrace the, the doctrines of grace or what we call Calvinism. Uh, I was working at a radio station and I was prepping for my shift, and the shift before me was this, uh, these people that were doing this call-in apologetic show, which was a pretty good show. Uh, but this guy called in, and he was a, uh, evidently he was a sort of a frequent, uh, you know, call, person who called in and sort of antagonized the, the, the host a little bit. And he was a universalist. He believed that, 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 uh, that everybody would be saved, that there was no such thing as, 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 as eternal punishment. And, uh, and his question to the, to the host was, he said, you, save, you say that you're saved, that you're not saved by works, right? And they're like, oh yeah, like we're totally, we're not saved by works. You say, but you're saved by faith, right? And he said, and then said, yeah, we're saved by faith. And he said, isn't that just another work? And I was like, huh, that's a good point. And I kind of, I kind of filed that away and that, that ended up uh, bearing fruits within the next year or, or, or so, but uh, faith, is itself a gift. I don't see Scobie here, but uh, I know that uh, we often point to Ephesians 2, 8, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not your own doing, it is, it is the gift of God. And I think Scobie pointed out um, last time that we met that um, it's probably not the best interpretation of that passage to equate when he says the gift of God uh, to make that a, a one-for-one uh, thing, you know, to, to, to the, the, we need to say that that is a gift of God, that for that to refer to faith. There's grammatical reasons for that. The genders or the nouns don't match up, um, and, you know, which is just another reason that all of you who are interested in Greek should sign up for Scobie's Greek class. It's been very informative. Um, but I'm trusting him on this one. I don't know enough yet to, uh, to make that uh, assumption myself. But you're on better exegetical ground, though, to point back. But that doesn't mean that that is not true, that faith is a gift. Uh, you're on better exegetical ground uh, for, that to, for it to point back to all of the blessings that are being talked about in chapter 2, uh, which include faith. Uh, it's all of God, even the faith, all, his, all, all of the saving work, all of the, that, we, that, we, that is needed for salvation, including faith, is the gift of God, even the faith. If you, let's take your Bibles. And you, turn with, could you turn with me to Ephesians 2? You don't need to read it out loud, but I just want, just want, just want to look at it. Ephesians 2 is a picture of where we are 
outside of Christ. And what does, where does the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2, what does, it, what does he say is our condition uh, before we are saved? Dead in tre- the trespasses and sins. We are dead in trespasses and sin. We are not like pretty sick in sin and trespasses. We're not like mildly weakened in sin and trespasses. We are dead. And what does a dead person do? They do nothing. They they don't respond in any way. You can't ask a dead person to have faith in someone. What are some other ways that the scripture talks about the natural condition of men and women apart from Christ? Some other pictures of, of, of what we are like. Orphans. Orphans. In verse 3, it says children of wrath. Children of wrath. Uh, I think one of, the, one, of the, one of the most graphic ones is that it says we talked about having, that we have a heart of stone, that we are unable, that our hearts, the, our inner person is unable to respond to God as it should. So in order for us to have, to have faith, Something needs to happen first. We need to be made alive. The dead need to be made alive. The heart of stone needs to be made a heart of flesh. Uh, the, The theological expression that you sometimes hear is grace precedes faith, which means that God needs to give us his regenerating grace. He needs to change who we are first in order for us to have faith It's also a really helpful way to remember the order of the youngest Tovia daughters because they have grace and then they have faith. And grace is older, (laughs) so grace precedes faith. And so uh, it helps me keep that straight. Um, So faith is a gift. It is the result of a changed heart. It is, and and the the important thing about faith, it it is the, the means by, the thing that connects us to the saving work of Christ. As the, as the catechism says, I cannot take hold of it or apply it any other way than by faith. It is by faith that Christ becomes our, our righteousness before God. That was what the question is. How do we know that Christ is our righteousness that, before God? How is it that by faith we can be righteous in him or, be, or before God? There's a theological term for that, for being, being made righteous before God. Anyone, anyone have any guesses? Justified. Justified. Justification. Um, sometimes you'll ask, uh, people will, will give a de- definition of justification, and they'll say, justification means it's, anyone know? It's just as, just as if I'd never sinned. And that's true. There are that, that, I'm not saying that that's false. Uh, it is, but it's only true as far as it goes. Um, and that's what the catechism is talking about in this first part, when it talks about that through faith we have the satisfaction of Christ. In other words, he satisfies the penalty for our sins. His work has, has wiped the slate clean. It's, and it is as if I had never sinned. But... That's not enough. Neutrality is not the standard. His work has, has, so our sin is placed upon him. It's fully paid. And that's, that's sometimes called what they'll call the passive obedience of Christ, that he has paid the price for our sins. And that's, that's amazing, but it gets better because we need more than to have our slate wiped clean. We don't need to be neutral before God. We need actual righteousness. And Christ gives that to us too, as the catechism says here, because only the righteousness and holiness of Christ is my righteousness before God. In other words, we need not just for him to pay for our sins, but we need his righteousness and his holiness for us. Christ, in Christ, we don't just get our debts wiped clean. Christ fills our bank accounts to the brim. He is credited our sin and we are credited his 
righteousness. And that's called, sometimes, I like to, you know, we'll give you a little, little, little glossary of, of theological terms as we go through this lesson. Uh, that's sometimes called the active obedience of Christ, that we not only have the benefit of his, sa- of, of his death and his saving work paying for our sins, but that we, his, his active obedience to the law, to God's commands in his life, is also credited to us. He is our righteousness. Um, some of you probably are probably familiar with the name J. Gresham Machen, a uh, theologian of the early 20th century, started Westminster Seminary. And uh, just as he was on his deathbed, the last telegram that he sent was to his friend and uh, another professor at Westminster Seminary, John Murray. And his telegram said, as he's on his deathbed, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ. No hope without it. And faith is the thing that connects us to that passive and active work of Christ. Faith is not a work. It's the way that we take hold of and receive the benefits of the work of Christ. And that's why when we're struggling, we might be tempted to think to ourselves, I I don't know. I don't know if my faith is strong enough. Maybe uh, I'm not strong enough to hold on. We can be encouraged that, that our salvation does not rest on how strong our, or weak our faith is. Our salvation rests and our hope rests on who that faith is in. It is not the faith, the strength of our faith that saves us. It is who it connects us to. It connects us to, and by it we take hold of the work of Christ. And so if our faith is in Christ, we are not saved because our faith is strong enough, but because the Savior is strong enough. And so when we say that we are saved by faith alone, we don't mean that it is by the the merit, that, that faith somehow by itself, all by itself, it is, is of such merit that it saves us. No, but it's, faith is, doesn't have any merit in itself, but it connects us. It's the only way that we can take hold of the satisfaction, the righteousness, and the holiness of Christ for us. So that's why we can affirm that we are righteous by faith only. So secondly, so the question that we always, the thing that we've always wanted to do from all history is be like, but can't, can't I add a little something? Uh, can't, well, can't I just, can't we earn, I, you know, I, you know, I want, you know I, thank you, God, I just want to do my part. Uh, can't we just earn a bit of our righteousness? We are naturally uncomfortable with the idea that we don't bring anything to the table except our need of salvation. The only, the, when, when we talk about you know, what we bring to the table of salvation, we bring the sin. That's the part we bring. Why is it that we can't get any credit for our good works when it comes to our righteousness before God? Well, first thing, the, the big problem with that is that there's, there's the implication there that somehow that there's something lacking in the work of Christ, that that's not quite enough. Like, so he gets us 95% of the way there. Maybe, uh, maybe 99% of the way there. And, but it's up to us to kind of hop over the finish line. I don't want to trivialize it, but there's, it's, that's kind of very close to the Roman Catholic teaching. That like, you know, hey, in baptism, you know, your original sin is wiped out, but you kind of, you got to make sure you stay there. And that's the error that Paul uh, he didn't pull any punches when he was talking to the Galatians. Uh, he said that, you know, they, they said like, hey, Christ is good, but wouldn't it be better if we had Christ plus the Old Testament law? Christ plus circumcision. In their case, uh, Paul said, that's not just a different take. That's not just some different seasoning on top of, of your take on Christianity. Paul says, that is, that's another gospel. 
That is a false gospel, one that is accursed. Because what's the problem with that? We are judging our works like we would judge another person. We are, uh, we're thinking of God like he's one of us. We're making him in our image. We're, you know, how do we judge other people? We sort of weigh the good versus the bad. Like, do they do more good things than bad things? Um, we judge outcomes, not motivations, because oftentimes we don't know the motivations. And if, you know, and so what was the, re when we judge, what is the, re what is the result of their actions. But we know that God, so we're, we're having to judge that way because we only know things imperfectly. Also, we're biased because we know just how bad we are. Uh, I think all of us, all of us at some point in our life have thought, if anybody knew what actually went through my head, they would never speak to me again. And so if we look at the scriptures, what is the standard that God says, this is the righteousness, this is the standard for what righteousness is. This is anything less than this is disobedience, is sin, is worthy of eternal punishment. Where is that summed up? That's the gospel, that's, that's his offer, but what does he command of us? Like, what does he, what are the, what is, what is, what does he say? This is what the standard for what is right and what is good uh, and what is, what, what true obedience looks like. Yeah, and, and what does that look like? The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments, also summed up, you know, sort of condensed in the two great commandments. I know I talk about that almost every week when we do the uh, confession of sin during the worship. Love the Lord with most, like, you know, with a reasonable amount, because I'm, come on, don't go, don't go too crazy. Let's have some reasonable standards. No, love the Lord with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And in case you were confused and said, well, you know, I think I do pretty good on that one. Uh, Jesus lays out further, expands upon what that might look like in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, oh, it's, it's not enough to not just to, to not sleep with your, you know, your neighbor's wife. Like, if you, if you lust after her, sin. Like, you have committed adultery. Like, maybe not as far as your relationship with, this, with, with other people are, but as far as, uh, like, your obedience to God, you have fallen short. Uh, it's not enough to just, like, not club someone over the head. Jesus says that if you speak harshly, call someone a name, you have committed murder in your heart. Every good thing that you and I do is, in fact, a mixed bag, isn't it? If the standard is, do everything out of a perfect love for God and neighbor, what have you done that meets that standard? And so we think that we should be justified, that we're okay, that we're good people, because we have put the standard way down on the floor and that's not where the standard is. And it's only by looking at what Scripture says that we know where that truly is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Got that in the wrong order, but you know what I mean. Uh, love your neighbor as yourselves. Now, of course, loving God, loving your neighbor, that might be part of your motivation. If you are a believer, I, I, I believe it, that probably is part of your motivation as you do good things. But sometimes it's also because I want to be, I want to be seen as the kind of guy that does those things. I, this makes me feel, this makes me feel good. It makes me feel kind of like I'm, I'm a good person. Maybe it's you obey simply because you're afraid of the consequences. But even our good works are stained with sin. That might be enough for you and me, but that is not enough to be, make them acceptable for God. So that's why so our good works can't be righteousness or some part of our righteousness before God. That might be a reason for us to, our, for our righteousness before men, but there's nothing that we can point to in our work before God that says, 
God, you need to love me. You need to favor me because I earned it. Because, that there, because of something that I did. All right. Any questions before we go on? Any comments? Okay. So if that's the case, sometimes we, many times actually, we hear in the scriptures, particularly Jesus, talking about being rewarded for our works. Uh, and so what does that mean? The, the catechism says, how is it that our good works merit nothing, seeing God promises that he will give a reward for them both in this life and the life to come? Um, could you, someone take out their Bibles. Sorry, I should have given previous warning. To turn them to, to Matthew 5 uh, and find verses 11 through 12. And could someone else, actually, can I have a volunteer for that? Anyone volunteer to take that one? Travis? And then could someone else take Luke chapter 6, verse 35? Matthias? Um, all right, Travis? When Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Right, and so, all right, Jesus is saying, hey, if you, uh, when you are persecuted, you will have a reward. Well, uh, so, in Luke, Luke 6. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Right, and so, same way. Jesus is talking about if you obey in this way, there will be a reward. I'm not going to read, read it all, but if you look at uh, further in the Sermon on the Mount than we just looked at, uh, in Matthew 6, we see that, um, that when you, it's when it talks about giving to the needy, do so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who is in secret will reward you. And same way when you fast, fast in secret, because your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Indeed, the, the scripture does talk frequently about our good works and their reward. But the thing that we, first thing we should see here is of none of these, and none of these things that we're talking about, are we talking about what makes us acceptable and righteous in God's eyes? What is the basis for our salvation? But the other thing that we need to remember is that God is our creator. And as, and as we talked about in salvation, we are recreated. We have uh, that, that, that grace precedes faith, that we are our heart of stone is turned to a heart of flesh. In Romans 11, the Apostle Paul says, Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? Everything that we have is a gift. All is gift everything that we have. And so when we do good works out of faith, where did that faith come from? It came from God. And so we owe that faith to the Holy Spirit. So when God rewards us for his good works, he is, in a sense, glorifying his own work in us. It's not necessarily exact parallel, but I, I like to think about it in, like, how in um, the... In Revelation chapter 4, when it talks about when, we, when, when the, the, the eyes of the Apostle John are, are, you know, he's given that glimpse behind the curtain. And he has a vision of heaven. He sees the, the living creatures and he sees the, 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 the elders with their crowns on. And it says that whenever the living creature gave glory and honor and thanks to him who was seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall before him who was seated on the throne and worship him. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And so there's a sense in which even the gifts that God, the rewards that God gave them of the crowns, they use those not to say, look at me, look at the crown. Isn't this great? Did you know what I did to earn this crown? They said they used even the, the rewards that they have received to, to give glory to God. And so I, 
at the risk of, of straining this, this path is too, too far. I think that like the rewards that we seek uh, and, the, and that we would receive in heaven are not for us to glorify ourselves, but to say like, look at what God in his graciousness enabled me to do. Look at how he changed me. Look at how he changed my heart and made me love him and serve him and want to do, want to love him and love my neighbor and, like, and, and, to, and to use that to glorify him, not ourselves. And it says that reward is given not of merit, not because we earned it, because everything is a gift, but of grace. It was God's good grace that he enabled us to love and to serve and to do the, the good works by which he earns, or, you know, not earns, but like by which you receive those things. Uh, one of the books that I read gave the picture of, like sometimes you'll have a, a little kid, he does, it makes a craft for his, for his father, you know, back in my day it would be, you know, you'd make, you'd make an ashtray for your dad, uh, and it was usually a blob, it, they probably didn't smoke anyway, uh, and you would give it to your dad, and he's not saying like, on the basis of this excellent workmanship and this very useful thing, I, I appreciate you and you have done good work. He says, no, that even though the, there's much that is lacking in the craftsmanship, in the gift itself, the, uh, the intention delights the Father. And so in the same way, even though our works are at best mixed with sin, uh, as those who are in Christ, uh, who are new believers, we have uh, right motivations, right works mixed, you know, that are, that are never perfect, but mixed together with, uh, with sin. But yet the Lord honors the love and the thanksgiving that they come from. But those rewards are not earned, they are graced. And so if that's the case, then of course, the question that always comes up, whenever the gospel is properly presented, the question that's going to come up with, uh, does not this doctrine make men careless and profane. Uh, we probably wouldn't say it exactly that way, uh, but what does, that, you know, what does that mean? Basically, if that's true, then, then yeah, I can keep sinning. Uh, it sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Um, Romans 6, that's the, what the whole chapter of Romans 6 is about. Paul was talking about, hey, uh, you know, if you are presenting the gospel biblically, you are going to get the objection, hey, if God is glorified by forgiving sinners, why don't I just sin more? God will be more glorified. Or if, if, if I'm not going to be punished for these things, then why shouldn't I just keep sinning? Why bother with obedience uh, if our righteousness before God doesn't depend on it? But that presupposes something about obedience, doesn't it? Anyone see? I know it's kind of a very open-ended question. But what does that sort of presuppose about obedience? It basically says that the only reason that we would obey is out of fear of punishment. And that's pretty telling about a person's view of God, isn't it? It's like, why would you obey him if uh, you don't need to do that for salvation? It would say, it, 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 if the only reason that we would ever want to obey his commandments is because we're afraid that otherwise we'll be punished, then we see that, uh, we see the problem with that is that we are, number one, already way past deserving punishment. And secondly, it completely leaves out God's love, God's grace, and our response of gratitude. Why do we obey? And Romans 6, like I said, I'm not going to read the whole, I didn't read the whole chapter, but I had to, you know, as Paul's dealing with this, the, very, the last four verses, it says, those who are incorporated into Christ through faith necessarily, um, sorry, for, uh, for when you were saved slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. And the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Before, you were a certain kind of person and you bore fruit 
that was in keeping with that. And now you are a new creation, and now you're bearing a different kind of fruit. Why do we obey? Because it's who we are. No one has to threaten a apple tree with punishment to get it to make apples and you know or to grow apples and not pears it grows apples because it's an apple tree and so we hate sin because that's who we are we are in Christ we are a new creation we love the things that he loves and so you can have two different people who are both uh, at least outwardly faithful to their spouse one does it because he is, or she, is afraid of the consequences of what would happen to them in their lives and their respectability and their finances and all these things if they get caught. And the other person is faithful because they love their spouse. Because they want to bring their spouse joy and not, uh, and, and not to spare. They want to uh, do the things that, that bring, that, 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 that that benefit them and they, and they would hate to do the things that would hurt them. And the person that is making this objection is thinking like that first spouse. The only reason to obey God is because you're afraid of the consequences. And therefore, if there's no consequences, there's no reason to obey him. There's a, you're probably sick of hearing this, but there's a Tim Keller quote that I've used several times before. And I think Nick did in a sermon a couple weeks ago as well. It's so good, it's worth saying again. And that is that man-made religion says, I obey, therefore I am accepted. Whereas Christianity says, I'm accepted, and therefore I obey. If we're dead to sin, if we're a new creation, that's going to result in different behavior, different affections, different thoughts. That's why it says, those who are incorporated into Christ through faith, if you are united to Christ through faith, then you are different. And that, is, that will necessarily bring forth the fruits of thankfulness. If you are grateful, you are going to live in a different way. A changed heart shows itself through a changed life. If we're, gonna, if we're dead to sin, if we're a new creation, that's going to result in different behavior, different affections, different thoughts. Not, not perfect behavior, not perfect thoughts, not perfect desires, but different. We necessarily will bear fruit, not out of fear, but out of who we have been made to be. We're saved by faith alone, but as is often said, not by, we're saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. A changed heart shows itself by a changed life. We see this, we see the difference. There's a couple places in the Gospel of Matthew where Christ shows us an, an interaction, and pulls back and, 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 and shows an interaction at the, at the end times of, 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 of people who are uh, of two different groups of people. To one of them, he says, uh, the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food, and I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when do we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. The Lord praises them for their good works, and they're surprised. They say, I, I didn't even know. I didn't even know. They weren't trying to earn anything from God. Their, their uh, motivation was not trying to earn merit, but they were bearing the fruit of those who were dead to sin and alive in Christ. But in Matthew 7, he gives a different example when he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. 
Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. You're saying, Lord, didn't I earn anything from you? Where's the appreciation? They had thought that their works had earned them something. And that's the, that's the difference. G.I. Williamson says in his book on the Heidelberg Catechism, the only good works that can ever please God are the ones that we do with no thought whatever of merit. And so we can see that, that, that a right understanding of the gospel does not lead to sin abounding, does not lead to us not caring about sin, but that changed hearts lead to changed lives, all not out of fear of punishment, but out of love and lives of gratitude. That's why we talked about the, how the, the, the catechism is, is, is divided up into those categories of we understand our guilt, there's guilt, grace, and then gratitude. That, 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 that gratitude section is that's, that's our life. That's where we live. That's, this is how we think, how we act. It is a response to knowing our guilt, receiving God's grace, and we respond with lives of gratitude. We're running a little bit late, so let me, let me close up in prayer. Father, we, we are so thankful that you have made us new creations, and yet, Lord, we know that we are not yet what we will be, and we are not yet what we long to be. And so, Lord, we pray that we would be filled with not fear of punishment, fear of discipline, Lord, but that we would be filled with a desire to love you and to love our neighbor, to follow you in obedience and discipleship because we love you, because you have uh, loved us abundantly. You have pour showered out your grace upon us, and we have only the tiniest foretaste of it now, uh, and we can look forward to, your, to, to being the recipients of your grace in your presence gloriously for all eternity. Lord, we pray that that would be the motivation for our love, for our obedience, for our good works, and that all of these would be done, uh, not for our glory, but for the glory of our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.